Oh, no, me. I'm Eric Banks. I'm the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU. And I'm really pleased to welcome everyone um, here this afternoon. Uh, this is normally the hour of our, it's not normally, it's still the hour of our uh, Friday Fellows lunch, which we've been doing all semester via Zoom. But we're so happy to welcome all our guests today who are tuning in uh, for this conversation uh, that we are co-presenting with the Center for Ballet and the Arts at NYU. Uh, between Alex Rubin and James Lasden. Uh, before we begin, I want to say a special thanks to Jennifer Homans, uh, who's the uh, executive director of the uh, Center for Ballet and the Arts, and her staff, uh, Lauren Kill, uh, Andrea Salvatore, and Sabrina uh, Mary Udelson for helping to put this together. And I also want to say a special thanks uh, to uh, Carol Tchaikovsky, who's been our, our wonderful uh, uh, student assistant this entire term and has helped us to facilitate all of our uh, Zoom luncheons. Um, when uh, the idea was, was hatched earlier this year that we might collaborate with the center on a luncheon, uh, I was thrilled to, to hear the idea that was presented around Alex Rubin's CBA fellowship this year. His project is based upon the short story, Trumpet Voluntary, as you, I'm sure you know, by James Lasden. Of course, James Lasden is a fellow of the Institute. So it's, it's great that we're able to bring the two of them together uh, for what I'm sure will be a fascinating uh, presentation and conversation between them. Uh, I'm going to turn over the Zoom spotlight in just a second to, to James to begin. But before I do, I want to uh, let you know that the best way for you to participate um, in terms of your the comments you'd like to make, questions, et cetera, um, which we'll turn to after uh, about the first 40 to 45 minutes of the hour, um, is to take advantage of the chat button, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, feel free to chime in at any point if there's a, a, a point you want to make um, or a question that you want to raise during the conversation period. And what I will do um, once we get to that point is just call on people who have put together chat questions or chat convers uh, chat suggestions um, in that box and using that using that platform. So uh, it should be pretty straightforward. We find that that's easier than using the raise hand function. So just let me know if you have anything you'd like to uh, like to uh, offer in the way of a question, a, a thought, et cetera. So anyway, I look forward to the conversation and the subsequent discussion and welcome you all once again. A very quick introduction, uh, Alex Rubin has a background as a DJ and in art and design. Uh, he made three choreographic movies for cinema, each characterized by improvisation, sound, and social cognition. Uh, Roots, uh, 48 Minutes uh, Arts Council of England in 2008, a dance road movie in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina was selected in the top 20 movies of the decade by Jeff Andrew at the British Film Institute. Uh, Alex's awards and commissions include Sadler's Wells, BBC, and the British Council. His latest film, Gingerella, Rockefeller, 66 Minutes, Welcome, ACA UK 2018, was filmed in the Amazon in Europe during the rise of populism. And it is an imp uh, improvised essay about improvisation. James Lasden has written several books of fiction and poetry, as well as the screenplay for Jonathan Nossiter's Sunday, which won Best Feature and Best Screenplay Awards at Sundance. His short story, The Siege, was uh, adapted by uh, Bernardo Bertolucci's Besieged. His most recent book, Afternoon of a Fawn, was shortlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize. He writes for the New Yorker and the London Review of Books. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, James and Alex today, and I'll now turn over the Zoom spotlight, as they like to say, to uh, James Lasden. So James, take it away. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you all, and uh, it's lovely to see some familiar faces and, and, uh, and names. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, talk a little bit about the, the story so that you'll ha have some idea of what we're, we're, what we're discussing in the conversation afterwards. Um, this, this, this was written in like the, about 1988 uh, as a commission from The Guardian who were doing a series called UK 2001. Um, at that time, 2001 seemed very far in the future um, and I came up with a sort of dystopian satire uh, about an England where uh, an extreme Thatcherism has combined with uh, a kind of re regression to rigid class hierarchies and 
florid royalism. Um, it's narrated by a, a rather obsequious, ingratiating trumpet player who tells the story of how he and his family escaped ruin after he got involved in a disgrace. He got into trouble for playing a, a band song at a, at a dance. And the story takes the form of a journey through, through England. Uh, basically they survive, the family survives by making a series of increasingly degrading compromises. Uh, so cheerful piece. Um, and I'm gonna read the first, I'm gonna read the first two pages. Let's sort of set the scene here. My fortunes had been in steady decline since the events of 97. After the closure, deservedly punitive, I hasten to add, of the college where my wife and I worked as administrators, I attempted to turn my lifelong hobby to good account and did actually find work as a trumpeter on some of the recordings of patriotic music just then coming into vogue. However, it was not enough to keep us in any of the more secure neighborhoods. And following the Police Act of 98, we were obliged to leave the city altogether. Our borough could afford only the lowest level of policing and went rapidly downhill. It was soon no place for a respectable couple to be bringing up a young daughter. We moved west to the village of Horton Pusey near Bristol. My wife's cousin worked in the Lord Lieutenant's new offices and had promised her a job as a typist. It was a humble position, but not without its advantages. By then, the emergence of such figures as the Lord Lieutenant and the Lord High Sheriff from their century or more of ornamental obscurity was well underway. As a nation, we were in the first throes of rediscovering the ceremonial heritage that is of course so much of our life today. And to be employed at the court of one of these personages, ours virtually ran the affairs of the county, was immensely prestigious. I was able to use the connection to secure myself a position as second trumpet in one of the county's licensed dance bands. As well as the patriotic music I've already mentioned, we had been seeing quite a revival of traditional swing and big band music. One of the young princes had been championing it so enthusiastically that nobody of any discrimination would listen, let alone dance to anything else. Our stipends as musicians were small, but at least steady and there was seldom a week without an engagement at a dance hall or a gala or a house party for one of the better families of the county. It was on one such occasion that to my everlasting shame, I allowed myself to become involved in an act of monumental collective folly that brought this phase of our lives to an abrupt end. Over 40 years have passed since that evening and I'm now an old man, but I can assure my lady if she should ever do me the honor of reading this, that I am still able to blush for my former self. We had been playing at the Marquis of Avon's New Year's Eve party at Becklesley Hall. Midnight had passed. The year 2001 was in its second hour. Most of the guests had departed and those that remained were somewhat the worse for wear. We, the band that is, were tired and by now also a little tipsy. Not that I offer this as an excuse, the intervals between numbers were growing longer, the numbers themselves slower and more sentimental. It was perhaps not surprising that those of us left in the ballroom should suddenly find ourselves plunged into one of those strange moods of desolate sadness that was so much a feature of post-war life. By that, I refer, of course, to the Second Falklands War of, 90, of 97, where His Late Majesty, after being obliged to authorize the military's ousting of Mr. A's prevaricating government, had courageously ordered the destruction of Buenos Aires, winning us the war at the cost, negligible compared with what we had gained, of international ostracism. I'll leave it there. Thanks, James. <laughs> um, so I had a visceral connection to James' story, um, and I, I was actually, I was on my way to see uh, my girlfriend in Paris and uh, I missed the plane. And then I picked up the newspaper. This was before Eurostar. So I picked up the newspaper and there was James story and it, I just had an immediate visceral reaction. Um, and I'd like to ask James, like, you know, what made you write it? What, I mean, I know it was a commission, but 
that it's such an emotional piece that, and I love it. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about why. Well, well, thank you. Um, I, I'm be trying to remember exactly what it came out of. And it, I mean, it was, you know, the, the, the Thatcher era, 1979 to 1990, was pretty much exactly my 20s. It was the time when I kind of came to some sort of political consciousness, I suppose. And, you know, it was very extreme to see everything that you had grown up with, this sense of being in a kind of state that more or less cared about its citizens, um, being steadily dismantled as her ethos of privatization of everything, of private enterprise, and the reduction of all value to money, basically, steadily took over. And one by one, British institutions were kind of succumbing to this. And the whole tenor of life in England, just everything you one took for granted was changing. So I think that was that was sort of what was what was in my head. And 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 the idea of just taking that to the a logical extension and seeing seeing what kind of world could be imagined by doing that. Right. Um I think uh, for me it gave this, the visceral connection was, it felt so much in the moment and that the tone regarding class and satire of class was, it just hit a nail on the head for me. And, and straight away, your, your writing is so cinematic and so poetic in terms of like an economy of language, which, which we just heard and describing situations that immediately I could feel myself in them. So it was almost like you took me forward and at the same time put me in the place and the story never left me. And that's why I want to develop a film and really grateful to be at CBA working on it. Um, I think um, the dystopian view of the future that, that I felt then, it, it, it feels to me that that's where we are now. It feels like it's come home to roost. And um, I think what's key and what made me really want to make the film in terms of imagining actual scenes and where would I have a starting point was one literal scene and that's the, the ballroom scene because key at the end of James's reading was the ostracism of the UK from the rest of the world and the cultural metaphor, metaphor upon which the, the story and my, and my dance idea hinges, that music and therefore social collective dance is banned and except for licensed county dance bands as James read um, and when that rule is broken by the landed and, and ruling gentry it results in um, in his his shocking death I'm sorry that's a spoiler alert but um, the rest of the story is great so um, it and it's a beautiful idea and it, it prompted me and and it prompted a choreographic idea that I I researched at the place London in Choreodrome which was a uh, um, directed by Theresa Beattie at the time. And um, I, I started to experiment in, in Choreodrome. Choreodrome is wonderful as a residency, just like um, CBA, it's related uh, because you can experiment with music. So I was combining different musics at the same time as I was experimenting with choreography. And I was particularly looking at um, uh, Baroque and um, Contra or set dance. I know in America it's called Contra dance or set dance. Um, perform to reels and um, I was looking at that inflected with modern dances that reflect the British multicultural culture that I grew up with and uh, that I think is also reflected in James story in a different way and I was a DJ then and was for most of my, my working life up till now and um, so I was bringing ideas of movement to traditional British folk movements that included Jamaican and West African and British influences. And that in itself was a, was a metaphor, just as James Story is, is a metaphor of a kind of reversion to a um, imperial British colonial attitude. And um, nowadays I would say that um, what I would like to do in, as the story goes on and my way of developing it would be to update that and to keep doing that with modern modern original styles and musics and all sorts of things like grime and garage um, and that combination is is reflected in other films that I've done where I filmed dance and um, contrasted contrasted them to show 
their links, that they're not so far apart. And at the same time, how our political and colonial and all kinds of class backgrounds combine together in music and dance. Um, so maybe I could show a clip of uh, from Roots, uh, which Eric kindly mentioned. Um, there's some extracts and Roots is a, is a dance road movie um, during and in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and it has no words uh, at all. And uh, that was a relationship to what I was perceiving then of lies and truth, for example, in the invasion of Iraq and what's now being called truth decay, I, I noticed. Um, and uh, it was commissioned by Arts Council England and this is uh, his uh, five minutes of, uh, of extracts. Can I, Alice, can I just point out that this is Roots spelled R-O-U-T-E-S. Uh, I mean, pun intended, but pun works better in, in English pronunciation than, than American. Uh, Thanks, James. Thank you. Thank you. 
sorry about the glitch. <laughs> um, so James, did you, um, you were going to comment a little bit, I think, but for me, yeah. go on, go ahead. No, go ahead. What? Well, I was going to say that what connects, what James and I've discussed is how in Trumpet Voluntary, the, the family travel through um, different regions. Um, and I think, and we, and we begin to see in that story a, a kind of devolution. Uh, you need a visa to travel from one town to another, for example. And what's been incredible and why it, this sense of devolution in the story and the ostracism feels like it's happening to me now, you know, for, for Buenos Aires, you can read Brexit, you know, and then we have such for sheriffs, we actually have examples of, of um, politicians in the UK in the 2000s suggesting that we have sheriffs. Um, so as absurd as James metaphor might appear at the beginning, I, it doesn't feel you know, it feels kind of really real. And as the years went by, and it's over 30 years now, each year, it got more and more real for me. Um, and so that's what's relevant about Roots is how it's episodic in the same way James's story is, is kind of episodic. Sorry, James. Well, I wanted to talk about that. I mean, we'll get on, we, we should get on to the, the kind of feeling of what it is to be in England today, because I want to hear from, from you about that. But... <laughs> But before that, I mean, I remember when you first showed me Roots, um, which is a, a, an extraordinary film. Um, Thank you. It, it I mean, it, it's your road movie, and it, it is, it's this journey through, through America, looking at it through dance. And um, as you said, my story is a kind of, is a road story. So I could see the connection there. But uh, what really interested me was how how you express place, how how people express place through dance. And I mean, as you pointed out, these very simple things you can't have step dancing without a porch or a floor or something. It's not something you can do in a field. You can't have that kind of cheerleader dancing without bleachers. So there is this kind of intimate connection between the dancing and the place that occurs sort of naturally, which I I'm. From what you've told me about your plans for the, for this adaptation, you're going to you're going to look for something similar in 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 the story that I've written. Are, are you are yeah. you going to be looking for sort of pre-existing dances that exist or, already as part of a vernacular? Or no, I, I'm going to. I mean, the pre-existing dances that we have and that do exist, especially social dances, are already amalgamations that. You know, relate to slavery, to colonialism, to migration. You know, these are physical languages that that mix together and uh, come out in a way that is is often is so beautiful and so interesting and so fast moving. So, by my idea is to visually connect the multicultural forms of dance and music. And in my films, the film language, is, as you're suggesting, is dictated by movement. So it, it's a kind of choreo geography rather, rather than a psycho geography. It's the way that we move in the environment, even the literal physical touching of the environment, and even the cognitive space where we see dances or how, you know, how our sense data um, experience movement. We, you know, I don't like roots being seen online because you don't have the same kinesthetic empathy, empathy, the same physical empathy that you do with the sound and the dancing as you do in cinema. And Roots has, has no words at all. So I want to build like a, I intend to develop Trump, Trumpet Voluntary with a related structure of, of a series of different tableau, like tableau vivant, moving, literally moving pictures. And each tableau will be a live performance of dance, kinetic design and music created by arts collectives influenced and, and that's one of the things I'm going to be researching physically when I'm when I'm at um, CBA um, and th those the ideas for each collective will be different and according to different elements that are in your story but metaphorical whether they be nature or science or there are all kinds there are so many exciting visually stimulating ideas in in the story um, and I'm also going to use the, the influence of the ideas of William Morris and John Ruskin and the arts and crafts movement. Um, not, not the visual aesthetic so much, but they, they believed that 
everyone has the right to beautiful utilitarian art design dignity and labor and access to nature these are key points now you know that was a reaction to the industrial revolution and now i think we're beginning to see a reaction to the technical revolution so i'm collecting um, references and uh, particularly fashion and textiles and uh, shall i share some of them as quickly as as we uh, talk yes so, yeah So these, these are references that come from fashion textiles, mostly British, and also images of um, this image of, of um, the foot and mouth, the, the outcome of the foot and mouth disease, the CBE um, virus that was transmitted eventually to humans from animals. And it's obviously got a resonance now, but it also ties in with the time of the story. Margaret Thatcher uh, being regal, as, as James um, related to, some ballroom movement there different elements of tactile design, Ava Hesse, textiles, Richard Long. Um, and some of these themes will, different parts of these themes will inhabit each, each separate tableau in a different form, but it will also be a collaboration and a collective. And one of the ideas I hope to do is to be able to give people that are, that are in the collectives um, the ability to have a, a small percentage to own a little bit of the film so that they're actually able to be literally a kind of cooperative, however small. This was the real you're example. Up, you're going to set up these collectives yourself, right? That's part of the project is to actually create art collectives, a different collective for each tableau. Is, is, is that yes. the, that's the idea, right? Yes. If if um, <laughs> sorry, I've <laughs> lost the uh, I've lost how to escape the uh, the. Um, how do I escape the uh, viewing? Are you Sorry, trying to share, the, share your screen? We haven't shared. You haven't. We haven't seen any of the pictures. That... Yeah, I think that's. Oh, we weren't sharing. No. Okay. There you are go. we sharing now? No, yes. we are. I'm sorry. Um, let's try that again. Sorry, James. Can you repeat the question? Um, well, I was just I was just saying that you were you're actually planning to set up oh yeah collect separate art a separate art collective for each sort of tableau each each uh, yeah each of the tableau out of which you're going to construct this narrative. Yeah, the idea is 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 to really look at place and location and the arts and crafts and design and skills in new technology as well and in dance like the literal craft of dance and the literal craft of of music and musicianship, but also set design. So I work with an idea, I'm basing the idea on something called total choreography, which is uh, um, taken from the idea of total football or, in it, or total soccer, it would be called in, in America, which is a form of very fluid, coordinated football or soccer. Um, so that's, uh, oh, that's, by the way, the sheriff uh, reference. So yeah, um, basically the idea is to either find collectives that already exist and some do, and they might not all be in the UK, which is, will be, for example, to, you know, I'll try and work with one in America, one in Japan, areas that have relationships both to the art and craft movement, but also to um, uh, Imperial Britain. And so either to set them up, and to work in a concentrated area for two weeks and build an environment. So it's a self-contained environment, a little bit like um, in your story, we move from one very specific area to another. It doesn't flip back and forth. It is a road, it is a kind of road trip. And, and in the same way as in Roots, we, we go on a journey where each part of the film is both works as a connection, but is self-contained. The narrative will be the linking structures within each one of those tableau or or arts collectives. So you you I think what you what one of the things you told me was you're, what you're proposing to do in terms of storytelling is that these tableaus they're not going to be illustrating a scene except for the ballroom scene at the beginning. They're not you're not intending to be storytelling by literal transposition of a scene from my story into a kind of dance tableau. You're you're looking for something that has a more metaphorical yeah. relationship to the text yeah exactly talk a little bit about 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 how how you see that 
okay well actually, actually manifesting on the screen it's obviously because i'm interested in cinema so it's hard to write this it's not the sort of thing where you can write a script that just isn't going to work but the nearest example i could find as a reference would be something like um maybe uh ozu's um um, Yasujiro Ozu's idea of, or, or his ideas are described as a um, uh, pillow shot. Um, and a, a pillow shot in, a, in an uh, Ozu film is, um, is kind of like a pause, as it would suggest. And so the pause is, a, you know, it's not something you can write in a script, you just can't. But they're they're quite short. I've got some examples here. Would you like to see them? Yes. Okay. So, so they, these are where he pauses. He takes. He cuts away from some some drama where an emotion has begun to crystallize, and he looks at a an apparently inanimate object or something. Yes. Um, there's a someone's put a series of them together. So should we have a quick look? Can you see yeah. my screen? Mm -hmm. So um, in, in Roots and in my other films, you have these shots as well, only then I didn't know they, <laughs> they were called pillow shots and that other people use them in the same way, uh, or not the same way, but related. And my idea in Trumpet Voluntary is almost to do the opposite, but to make these shots the main shots and to make James's story, which is so moving, the transitions between these shots. And these pillow shots would be, um, you know, made enormous into these art, these improvised art, music, and kinetic uh, textile and set designs in a in a created environment, and be expanded to become the, the main shots of the film. And that's that's the idea. And it's a uh, it's a difficult idea to sell because uh, because you know you can't really write it. it, it I, with, with my films, I don't know if you remember James, but I had terrible trouble getting going with my films. And the main problem was you couldn't write them. And in the end, from the money I made DJing, I, I started to make the films. And then once people saw them, they started commissioning them. But as, as uh, that gets more difficult, as the films get bigger, and this is a, this is a big idea. It is, it is a, big idea, a, a big idea and a very ambitious one from how you've described it to me. And yet you have managed to, 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 to get interest. I mean, there's this fellowship that you're in talks with, um, yeah, the BFI, I believe, right? The, the yeah, I'm talking Film Institute to, uh, about developing it. I'm talking to a very exciting production company um, in in the UK in Bristol uh, called um, EDF Films, Early Day Films. Um, they're run by uh, Kate Byers and Lynn Waite. So I'm talking to them, and that's exciting. And we're talking to BFI. Um, so it's still a, a, a proposing a development stage. And yeah, that's, a, that's, you know, fingers crossed, that's a really exciting development. And that's how I hope to continue with it. And then there's the R&D that's going on as we speak with, uh, with CBA, which is really exciting. And where I can get to grips actually with, you know, with the choreography and with how these ideas come together. And I'm looking in New York at two, two, parts, two parts of that. One, one would be a little bit related to the earlier work done at the place in London. Um, and um, the place, by the way, is, is, a, is a, a dance centre uh, and home of London Contemporary Dance School. Um, but the other area I'm particularly interested in exploring in New York would be, I'm interested in 70s formation dance in, in Seoul, in African-American music of the, of the kind of 70s period. Um, you know, everything from early Jackson 5 to the Temptations to Detroit Spinners, this kind of area, and combining that with ballet. Um, so I've been talking to, um, about, those, about the first area I've been talking to, uh, I've started talking to researchers and past fellows like uh, Julie Malnick, 
um, and um, and looking and discussing with uh, with Jennifer Holmans, the director, like the history of the history of uh, ballet and the origins. And one of the interesting thing about the origins of ballet is, which I didn't know, is not just the social language, but the objective in trying to define a define or explore a, a truth, which I, I had no idea that ballet had had this in it. I, I do martial arts, and that's related. To, to my to my work and the movement, and I found a, a lot of similarities, which was a big surprise through reading um, Apollo's Angels, J Jennifer's book, um, History of Ballet. So, I'm explore those are the areas I'm starting to look at. Where do those areas combine? You know, what's the social and class history of those 70s? What uh, um, you know, videos and dances, and uh, how how the relationship of that to other forms of social language like like ballet, which for for however we see ballet now, it was a it was a social language at the time. We we, we should sort of turn over to questions maybe, but before that, I just like to to ask you. I mean, you, you we've been talking on and off about this project for for <laughs> quite a long time. And uh, in that time, We're getting old. <laughs> in that time, I mean, I, I kind of rather wrote that story in a, I mean, I, as far as I remember, in a slightly kind of flippant mood, mm -hmm. in, in the way that I was kind of pushing these tendencies to a slight, what I thought was a ridiculous extreme. Um, and, but, uh, you know, although England hasn't yet knew. Buenos Aires. It has uh, it has kind of ostracized itself mm. uh, um, in the most. I mean, in a way that I would not have predicted. Although you know that 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 that's a it's always been a kind of undercurrent of, of British life. Is this 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 kind of impulse to withdraw? This little Englandism. This this. Um, uh, what, can you talk to us a little bit about your experience of it and how it has felt and since Brexit, since Brit Britain has kind of committed this extraordinary act of self-whatever, separation, let's call it. It feels very painful, and especially like I, I collaborate with cognitive scientists. The last film was a collaboration with Professor Chris Friff, who's a cognitive scientist in London, and um, it you know, when you see how important those areas are, all the people Chris works with and that we collaborate with, for example, last year, um, whether it's work with, with uh, Marina Warner or um, and, and refugee work or with, with Chris and Tate Modern and, the, and University College London, uh, University of London, you know, these, these areas are so integrated in terms of, of Europe. I mean, that's one area that's touched me greatly, but there's, it's more an emotional area. And, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not like a right on liberal about the EU, but I'm, I'm a passionate Remainer. And I have ver very strong misgivings about both to, to do with democracy, to do with banks, to do with um, the way Greece was, was treated, is treated you know, the, in, in bankruptcy, the, these things are appalling. But at the bottom line is, is, is we are going to be isolated and we are hurting ourselves. And all our collaborations and all the exciting things that we experience with Europe, which far outweighs the other things that I've mentioned, not that those don't need working on, but where's perfect. So, yeah, you, you know, I, I just see how it affects so many people in, in so many different ways. And even right down to illness in, in my own family and how, you know, carers and nurses and doctors and so on won't be able to work. You know, now Britain is actually having to do outreach work in other countries to try and replace European workers that are leaving. And just on a human level, it's just, I can't explain the, how painful it feels. And I think when you read your story, you feel that pain in, in, in the metaphor for for what is um, slavery and serfdom, if I can call it, if you allow me to call it that, um, which is how the, how where the story le leads to, you know, it is you know, it, I connect those two things together. I do connect them really. I don't know if that makes sense to to, to you because how does it feel for you looking? You know, you 
you must have lived now more for, for longer in the states than here is that right it's true it's true i have um so how does it feel to you sad you know just sad i feel still very attached to 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 england but i mean and i would not have foreseen what happened but uh yeah it just fills me with sadness but we've got plenty of <laughs> plenty to occupy us here as well and the same and i mean the same tendencies and this is what what i'm sort of getting at as far as wondering where your film is going to go i mean this is something that's happening in the world this kind of withdrawal from collective yeah. enterprises uh into a very sort of bitter nationalism that the in my story i try to write about a little bit each country has its own flavor but I mean, we're seeing it here, we're seeing it in other countries in Europe. And I'm, I'm wondering if you're going to be looking to sort of consciously um, tackle that. Yeah, because the arts and crafts movement was uh, kind of roughly between 1880, 1890 and 1920. But after it emerged in the UK, it then emerged in, in North America. In fact, close to where you live in upstate New York, also Chicago. Um, and then in, in strategic places across Europe. And a way of tackling and showing some sort of unity is, is to do a few of these tableaus in strategic locations, be it Germany or, or wherever, that have a relate, you know, that have that old UK European relationship. And to, to draw attention to how we can collaborate, how we can collaborate so well and so beautifully by making something together in each one of those places that will then make this whole film, which will be both a European and reflect the, the poor sides of colonialism and um, imperialism. The other side of that that you're talking about is I think we found that attitude and discussing it with scientists with COVID. You know, I know we shouldn't be mentioning the C word, but I think we have to. And, you know, just in the way, the different reaction of, of the British. And when I talk to people, there was very much, I was talking to scientists in March and saying, wait, this is coming. Why, you know, why aren't we doing anything? And just from talking to people, the conclusion seemed to be a kind of arrogance, you know? It seemed to be a kind of, well, you know, we're not related to the rest of what is not coming here, you know? <laughs> you know? And in the UK, when I asked someone, a friend of mine who's Japanese, who, who is, really reticent to criticize, extremely polite, never says anything bad about the UK. And I said, what do you think? And she said she thought it was arrogance. And this, you know, your story epitomizes this kind of class system. And it is a story about class. And, you know, we can't avoid how can we be the fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world and have food banks? I live in an area, I live next door to me, we have people with you know six people in one in a two-bedroom flat we have food banks 100 yards down the road yeah. how can that be the fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world the other thing to do with covid and what's it, it it's brought to us is i want to make a film that shows touch you know that shows physical connection you know if it's not if we can't touch each other in this film because of covid then it will be done through the textiles and the fabrics and the, the relationship of that really is is not just COVID, it's to do with technology and, um, and how um, before people, for example, in certain areas of the world are, are stopping having babies. We are becoming a disconnected, non-physical, cognitive culture, if you like, if that makes sense. It does. And I think we should have some questions. Yeah, let's do that. Let's start to, to do that. Before, I, I, I wanna just start with a, with a quick question before turning it over to uh, the responses we have in chat. And I also wanna encourage you now, if you have a comment, a suggestion um, or question, um, if you'll indicate that by typing into, into chat, everyone. Um, I just wanna ask you, uh, you know, you, when you were talking about uh, the tableaus and about pillow talk and about the, the difficulty of um, uh, basically having backing because of the difficulties of writing, um, writing this, Alex. Um, you haven't said much about the role of language in the, um, in, in the work in, in progress. And I'm curious if you would say a few words about that, about, the relation, about how you're working with language um, in, the, in the film that you're working on um, and how it, how it may relate or not relate to, to gesture and to dance. 
Sure, thanks, Harry. That's a great question. So I'm interested in embodied language. Um, I, I call it uh, cognitive poetics, but it's the idea that, um, you, you know, in anthropology and in cognitive science is, is pretty much accepted that or, or considered that um, uh, movement came before words and that language and words are a recent thing. And if you analyze language, and I've done this with James's story, you find there are very few very few um, sentences that don't contain a word that's to do with physical movement. Um, and what we find, what's found it in, in certainly in neuroscience is that we use, we use this to make a point and we, we use it so often that we don't notice. And there are some obvious kind of metaphors like juggling ideas. Well, of course you can't juggle an idea, you know, but in research it's proven that the more you do that, the more that you use these metaphors, it does help the, your, your, whoever you're talking to, to to understand what you're trying to communicate. So one of the things I'm, I'm researching at the moment is how that could be a connection and a trigger as, as a narrative device to get into the tableaus. But not that the tableaus have to literally um, explore something, but that would be an abstract way of exploring um, embodied language. Okay. Um James, are you surprised to hear your, your writing characterized by in terms of its physicality? <laughs> I mean, I'm always surprised to hear it discussed any times, but it's, um, <laughs> it, I, I, I think, I mean, I, it, it doesn't, I mean, I, I think I do write, I, I need to sort of feel things and see them very, in, a very, in a very physical sensory way when I write, so, um, I, you know, it, it makes some sense to me to hear to hear to hear that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 I I think um, what Alex may be responding to is that is just that that I need to if I'm writing a scene, I have to really visualize it very clearly, and that usually finds its way into the way I actually describe it. I'm going to go to uh, the, the the first uh, comment that's come up on chat. It's uh, Mike uh, and Esther. Um, so if you can uh, unmute. Mike, and you can join us. Um, I, so I think my thoughts are around the current climate, that I'm Black, that I'm looking, like one of the things that we do is when we show up in a space is that we look around the room, right? You know, being Black in the United States means that I have to sometimes Google how racist is this place. I'm not saying that this room is that place, but it it is, I'm very hyper aware that I made that comment in this room. And I looked at the screens, the names, and I'm like, there aren't a lot of black folks here. And they're and listening, and I don't know Alex personally, but that comment was a little triggering for me because we were talking about um, Soul Train and where that intersects with ballet. And my thought, my immediate thought process is that there are people already doing that. And I also am hoping that folks at the CBA would provide guidance if Alex would ever lead into them in terms of the Black and Latino voices that already are exploring like that type of melange of choreography because they're out there. Um, I also wanted I hope that in that future exploration that it doesn't have a National Geographic feel, that it doesn't have a feel of Columbusing, like I have discovered something because they're out there. Um, and that that history is out there as well, that there are whole historians and, um, and dramaturge, Melanie George is another who works in this area as well around jazz dance and the, the black origins and the black roots of jazz dance. And what I heard was this idea of exploring, or at least the way that it registered for me, was this idea of exploring what sounds like a really fascinating topic, right? But never once did I hear the terms Black. And the things that also registered for me is like hearing these British accents and knowing that this is a very Black American experience that we're talking about, right? And I've, I've heard like European artistic directors talk about when they in ballet companies that when they get to the united states of america they're not necessarily prepared to understand race relations in the u.s 
and this and this came in other symposiums um, with um, memoirs of blacks in ballet, where the European artistic directors talk about how they really have to like dig into the history of the country. So like I take that into into consideration in terms of what I just heard, but it still registers that way for me, right? And I'm thinking like the brain trust at at CBA, like you know, knowing that alumni can always lean back into CBA, I'm like please lean back into that brain trust to have that conversation in a much more fleshed out way before whatever that subcomponent of the project is, is explored. And that's the reason for the comment. Um, and I'm glad that you allowed me to come on camera because this could have been like me just dropping the comment in the chat without any further dialogue, which kind of allows for a very human, humanistic exchange, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like leaving me in a silo to just drop that, which can seem inflammatory and then, you know, running off. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you, Mike. Alex? Um, well, thanks, Mike. Yeah, I mean, completely, yes. I mean, the idea in the story is, is, is a multicultural story because that's where I live and come from. And so the main character is black, um, but I'm not, I'm trying to collaborate and do, I hope I can do if when I come to New York, exactly what I would do here and what I, what I would do, because it, there's a number of um, uh, black members of, of CBA in the current cohort. And when I'm looking at research, I haven't started that area of the research yet, but certainly the whole, the whole idea of each tableau is to be a collaboration. It's not for me just to go in and impose, you, you know, I'm not going into a lot of them with expectations. The story is, is, is what it is, but um, yeah, completely agree. And it, um, it's a shame we can't look at the rest of Roots because it explores the question. It was, it was made in 2005. And one of the reasons the words were taken out was because first of all, um, the invasion of Iraq and how the voices in the UK who opposed it, which was massive, didn't have a voice, but the, um, the other reason was was the language, but in terms of the politics, you know, I, I was in Baton Rouge in the evacuee camps and so on, and in New Orleans and saw that, you know, we in inverted commas were able to pinpoint bombs in Iraq and we weren't able to lift people out of New Orleans. And we have the same problem with poverty in London, because whatever way you look at it, especially in COVID, black and particularly Asian and particularly South Asian people are being heavily impacted. And I come from a working class background, which includes, you know, all of those, every single group in, you know, that you can think of in our area. So we, our area is the most multicultural place in London. So I've what been, I see is that class affects that. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm saying I've been, and right now um, the singer Adele is actually having a similar debate because she wore some black hairstyles. But she mm -hmm. actually grew up in a multi, like in a pan Caribbean na neighborhood, and she donned like usual um, attire for the Caribbean carnival. And there's some people, if you haven't been to those neighborhoods, that don't know that like the the culture that she grew up saturated in. So for her, it was very natural and second nature for her to do so. But if you don't know that about certain areas of London, and you don't know that about Adele you would assume that it's outright appropriation. But I think that those types of conversations are what give context. Yes. Uh, and, I, and again, and this might be a race-based difference in terms of how we learn to speak from our position in that when you grow up other than white in the United States, you already come prepared to present the context immediately at, at the forefront. Yes, and I think if I start to appropriate, appropriate, I. I, I'm I'm wary actually of 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 uh, certain aspects of appropriation in in I don't care what class you're from it can still be appropriation, um, and I agree with you and I think I, I think I, I watched that that discussion around Adele as well and mm -hmm. it, it, it's a I think you'd agree it's a common one that keeps coming up and now especially because of uh, Black Lives Matter it's become more of a mainstream discussion whereas before there wasn't a voice that articulated and said, this is something wrong. There wasn't, you know, and it's very, it, it's t kind of taken the liberal middle class or the, the media to think actually, 
unfortunately, this is a subject that now people are interested in. Well, why weren't they interested in it before? You, you know, like what, what nothing's yeah. changed as, as you're pointing out, I think. <laughs> so, um, but I, I do see other um, questions coming up in the chat, so I'll pause there. Mike, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, let's go to uh, Karen Greenspan has a couple of questions, I think, about the uh, nature of the film's relationship to the story. So, uh, Karen Greenspan. Hi, um, that sounds like a really um, exciting creative project. I loved watching uh, the scenes from Roots. Um, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to go back to some basics that I don't quite understand yet. And that is what is the nature of the relationship of your dance film to the story? Are you retelling the story or is it serving as an inspiration and feeling what what is it so the 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 literal connection is the ballroom scene that we we that james and i talked about at the beginning that james is reading read out and that's that will be the only literal connection so we will actually have a ballroom scene that does combine historic dances that are appropriate to both the past and the future, because James's story is, is set in the future, but really it's about the past. Um, so, but the the idea that I was trying to explain really is is the nearest idea would be if you think about the the pillow shots idea, and that is that we we don't we don't have to literally do an expose. I don't. I'm I'm interested in how in musicals we're so used to seeing this idea of okay so we've got the story and this this story literally a line or an idea then starts turning into this bit of music or or a, you know a dance it, you know I'm trying to avoid this and trying to move to to reflect the metaphorical nature of James's story because it's a metaphor so what I'm looking at is how can we look at metaphors? For example, in James's story, there's a there's a festival there's a, there's a a festival or, or a celebration of uh, of clean air. Well, you know this is completely relevant now, but how do I do that? You know how do we do that without doing the obvious? Let's you know let's do a narrative dance about clean air or something. You know and this is, has no appeal to me whatsoever. So my way of looking at it is, how do we do something that works with nature? And one of the things I'm gonna look at is like hay sculptures. And traditionally they would make sculptures when they were doing the harvest, you know, in areas all over the world, but particularly in Eastern Europe. And this is actually a tradition and a skill and an art. So it would actually use that as a kind of punctuation. But as I said before, like the pillow shots, the punctuations in this films are gonna be the film. And James's narrative are gonna be the transitions. So these are like tableau. These are like when you when you look at a, a painting that is is has so many stories in it, but you have to read the metaphors. You know, like I still can't look at old paintings and understand because I don't have a kind of good art art history training. But when you talk to someone who does, all of a sudden it's like whoa. So I, I'm I'm trying to look at the story in a way that we would look at dance that you cannot. You know, dance is not about writing the dance. That doesn't mean you can't anal analyze it in terms of race, culture, history, all kinds of things. But at the bottom line is it's moving, it's emotional. And and I'm I'm a bit kind of bored of talking head films. So in my films, the movement dictates the language. The movement, I don't have a film where the music and the dance doesn't uh, doesn't dictate the language, Karen. I don't, I don't know if that answers <laughs> the, the question. Okay, I, I want to. Uh, we're, we're we're running a little over time, but I want to make sure that we uh, that we uh, take one more question. And I know that we'll probably lose some people, but uh, but we'll run over just a little bit. So I'll turn now to Julie uh, Malnig. Hi there. Hi, Hi Alex. Hi Julie. Hi. So Alex, I know you're interested in um, the history of social dance and particularly the history of Black social dance. Um, being you know, part of the roots of American social dance. But I wondered what it was in particular about the 70s formation dances or formation dance that connected you to James's story. In other words, where, uh, how does that dance in particular 
kind of resonate with you with the story? Why, in other words, why that particular type of social and popular dance form? Well, that was an example I gave of, make, okay. of one of the areas of research. So no, it's not- Oh, I big, see, okay. It's not influent, no, that's misleading. Got it, got it. Me, okay. maybe. It's okay. just, I, I can't talk about all, all the ideas in this time. So I, I looked at ideas that are relevant to this audience more because we, we have I a chance to oh, audience. I see. I see. So, so, you know, I'm at the beginning of that process and I work <laughs> instinctively and I won't until I've examined why I, you know, I grew up, you know, we, we grew up here and I grew up being influenced by that, by those clips, that dance, you know, I loved it. And what's interesting about when people look at the history of America and its influences is, is um, you know, there can be a lot of very critical observations, but what people forget is, you know, is particularly music and dance that, that originated in the deep South and the Southeast went on to colonize the rest of the world in a positive, and it did it because it was incredible because it was brilliant and people forget this. They think it was because of, you know, some kind of imperial power. Well, of course that has a big part, but we also mustn't forget that it was brilliant, you know, and it has roots and those roots actually do illustrate um, history and, and awful sight, the awful parts of history, um, you know, and, and people even forget obvious things like, you know, like, um, you know, get, you know, the swing in rock and roll comes from jazz. You, you know, they're, they're, you know, rock and roll didn't exist before jazz, you know, and obviously there's blues and folk music and everything else that comes into it. But the actual physical swing comes from movement. And I think we, we dissociate movement from dance, um, from music. Mm -hmm. And the, the normal thing is we think jazz dance comes from, we think jazz dance comes from jazz. Well, no, that's not strictly true because, you know, from my observations when I traveled about, and you can only do that, you can't find this in a book, you have to go there. Well, maybe there are books, but I'm not academic, is, is that you, you suddenly realize that, you know, the sway in a second line affected the march in band music and it put, the, put a certain swing into jazz. But I couldn't really know that until I went and saw it for, for myself. So the relation, I, one of the things I'm, in, I illustrate in my films is this relationship, this different relationship between music and dance. And, and for example, in, in step dance and in tap dance, where tap dance comes from, you know, which has everything from West African to Northern English clog dance influences. And, and you can't avoid slavery within that. You can't avoid that that's even ships, even dancing on the deck of ships and using the hull underneath to amplify the sound so that they didn't have to use so many slaves to, to actually dance, you know, so, so they could do more rowing. You know, this, this kind of thing relates to dancing on porches and dancing on, on the ground, being physically joined to the ground, and that the musicians are playing to the dancers. They're playing to the rhythm of the feet. So these are the triumphs things that are hard to talk about in words because it takes ages like this sorry yeah. for my long answer but yeah. that I, I can try and that I can try and illustrate um mm. in movement and, yeah. and also show how beautiful what we can create is and try and go against a little bit of the, the Brexit idea and the themes that James quite accurately and poetically uh portrayed thank you um, James, will you continue to be in conversation uh, with Alex and, and as the 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 the, the project uh, progresses? I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not. You know, it's, it's, as Alex said, it's not a it's not a film that's going to have a script. So there's not there's no screenplay or anything like that. But we we have. I mean, you know, we've been talking about this so long. We've become friends through it, and and we'll stay in conversation for mm -hmm. sure. Well, I look forward to the time that we can, uh, that those of us in New York will be able to see Alex in, in, in person, you'll be, that you'll be able to visit us physically, but it's been really good to visit with you uh, virtually today. And I really appreciate the presentation and conversation. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we will have uh, an archival recording of this available if you want to have another look at it. And uh, just thank you all and wish you uh, an early happy Thanksgiving.